This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Justin Ehrenhofer, the Monero Community Workgroup Organizer. Doug and Justin discuss the recent release of Monero Means Money and how he, with the help of the Monero community, were able to create the number two movie in America during the weekend of April 10th with only a $1,000 budget and within a 72-hour timeline. The movie is a documentary featured film based on Dr. Daniel Kim's talk at the 36C3 CDC, Fiat, Monero, and Bitcoin, 2008 to present. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Justin, thanks for coming on. So uh, you released recently in uh, Vice. That was uh, that was some big news. You you helped launch, or you were the, the main producer behind the the Monero movie. You want to uh, give a little feedback on that? Sure, Doug. So earlier this month, me and about fifteen other contributors put together Monero means money which is a Monero-themed feature film documentary. And it featured Daniel Kim talking about the merits of Monero compared to other currencies such as fiat, as particularly the U.S. dollar, and Bitcoin. And uh, it received pretty good feedback from the community. It's currently sitting at 9.3 on IMDb. And also, it was, for a very short period of time, Number one on the box office is in the United States because, of course, most of the theaters are closed because of social distancing and other, uh, you know, state-based requirements and federal requirements. So there weren't many people going to the theaters. We noticed that, organized, took advantage of that, were able to release a film in a, you know, in, in very, very short notice. And... People in the Monero community and outside were willing to support theaters. They, we saw an outpouring of support to purchase tickets where the proceeds went to the theaters. And there are many news articles that also thought it was a very interesting story, picked it up. Uh, Decrypt was the first one. They uh, reported while well, Monero was still uh, number one in the, in the list. But then, of course, a few hours later, uh, another movie came out that also published their findings and uh, their their box office sales. And so Monero Means Money is now the number two movie for the weekend and then the week that it, that it had the most of its, for its, for its uh, initial launch week. So we're still really excited. It's a little bittersweet because, of course, we were going for number one. But it's still really cool to say that we made the number two movie in, in the United States and that also it substantially benefited the theaters and helped share ideals and privacy to, to many people that might otherwise not have thought about privacy in, in these times. Mm. So mission accomplished, right? So this is this was the goal of, of what you were trying to do here, just become the number one the number one movie, or you were trying to make a make a decent movie? So the the goal ultimately was like what's the best movie we can actually make in order to release it in these times. That, that was the primary goal. Of course we wanted to make the best movie possible. If it was me making a movie by myself, it would have been really terrible. But ultimately we received a ton of really positive feedback from the community. It's not a traditional documentary where it cuts in and out of certain scenes. It really is based around one specific talk that Dr. Daniel Kim gave at the CCC in uh, December 2019. So it is very focused on, on one particular component. However, we still think that it's a very vital part, uh, a very vital component that we can share with newcomers that are interested in Monero, interested in privacy in general, or any sort of financial systems. And therefore, we we still think it's a really useful tool that we can point people to. At the moment, we are still charging people $10 to view the film. However, beginning in May, the film will be free for everyone to view. So it will be a really useful tool for us to point people to in the future. Awesome. So So I would say it's... Sorry, I would say like it's it's to answer your original question. 
it, you know, it, it's mission accomplished and that we didn't get quite what we were hoping for, but we nevertheless accomplished the goals that we were hoping for. So we're, we're still very proud about that. Right. I mean, you got written up in Vice. I don't think you could ask for more than that in terms of, right, getting some media coverage, right? I mean, that seems... Yeah, I mean, we were very pleased to receive uh, a request for comment from the Vice writer. I'm, I'm very pleased with the ultimate article. I'm also very pleased with the Decrypt article uh, that, that was written. So, yeah, I, I'm very pleased with the coverage we've received so far, and I hope that we continue to receive coverage going forward in the future. Do you think we're, we're seeing non-Monero people now watching this movie? you think it's having that effect, or is it uh, still just all of us tuning in, you know, paying to watch the movie among our community? You think oh, it, yeah, it absolutely is. Among the people that have watched the movie itself, I suspect that it's still predominantly Monero uh, community members. However, the interest that has surrounded the movie absolutely has extended beyond not only just the typical Monero ecosystem into the crypto ecosystem, but it has clearly extended beyond that into people who don't typically interact with cryptocurrencies at all, uh, given the nature of uh, especially the Vice article that was written in Motherboard generally, so just given to predominantly tech enthusiasts. And the, the title itself did not even mention cryptocurrency. So it certainly attracted a, a crowd that does not often over intersect with, with the Monero community. And, and if I show you the view count on the Monero means money trailer, uh, the first trailer that we made, which was embedded in the Vice article, you can see a very clear point where the article was, was published and, and the views started increasing and they are substantially greater than the views up to that point. So yes, it, the, the movie's impacts have clearly extended into the broader ecosystem and we hope that it will continue to capture people's attention outside of the Monero community too. So what originally gave you this idea? You were just, you just came across the movie ratings like uh, a few weeks back during coronavirus and you were just, just instantly popped into your head or and you, <laughs> you instantly thought of it as a, a way to kind of hack the system or what, what was kind of the, uh, the thinking there? How'd, how'd you come up with it? So it, it, I was absolutely not the only person that had this idea. I was looking on Reddit and I think it was like our movies where uh, there was uh, a thread about the first week's numbers after you know a full social distancing impacts went into effect. And the total box office for that weekend was about five. $4,000, $5,000. And I thought, you know what, this is a really, really low number. And other people were joking about the idea of themselves making a movie that they starred in, produced and directed. And so I'm like, you know what, maybe that's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> so uh, what those people didn't have, though, was a large community that were able to get behind the project and actually make something that people were able to purchase, to, that they were willing to watch within such a short window. I mean, starting next week, states are already opening up their theaters. So we, we may never have an opportunity like this again uh, in order to, you know, in a, you are correct in that it is totally a hack to just get up there. This is not a typical set of circumstances. Uh, COVID-19 has really changed things in the United States and the rest of the world, of course. And so it's not often that all theaters just close. So, um, yeah, I, I can't take credit for the original idea. However, I saw an idea, you know, reflected on it, reach out to you to get some feedback from you and others in order to know if you also thought it was a good idea or if I was just crazy. And ultimately, I still might have been crazy, but we went forward with the idea anyway. And we we're reasonably successful in, it, in its delivery. So it, yeah, it, it was not something even a month ago that I ever would have conceived doing. Yeah, I think, I think creative ideas like that are always initially perceived as, as crazy. So what, what was the hardest part? Uh, what was the hardest part in getting this up and running? I mean, the hardest part was that it was mostly a logistical challenge. I mean, you, you can keep adding things on top of each other, but like I had no experience producing or directing a movie at all. So you know, zero skills from, from the person that's trying to lead the project is a pretty significant barrier you need to overcome in the process. <laughs> um, also, 
we didn't know how any of the movie logistics worked. We ha- we worked with someone uh, that you referred us to, one of your close friends uh, that, uh, were, were, yes, we were, we were very pleased to work with Gianic in the process. He was the only person that had any experience at all working with movie backgrounds. And so it, it was sort of a weird, delicate balance where we're, we're receiving all this lovely advice from someone who actually knows what they're talking about. But nevertheless, we need to say, but we're also trying to make this a hack. Like we can't actually do something the right way because he, we don't have time. too professional. Yeah. yeah. Like, no, 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 he's no. Helped he's helped us a lot on our show, by the way. Yeah. He's been, he was fantastic. I was just saying in, in many cases, we're like, this is the way we, we should do something the right way. But like, given that we can't do this, what's the next best thing we can do? What's, what's the best thing we can do given the limitations. And there was a lot of that throughout the process. Um, otherwise, if we would have gotten caught up in any particular impact, uh, we would not have released the movie and we would not have gotten uh, the outpouring of support that we did. Uh, I mean, ultimately, I think... The most, go ahead. I was going to say the most important part was making sure that those reportings came in, right, and got posted. So then you, you reached out to the individual companies that are doing that and like you actually got them on the phone or how, how did that work? Yeah, I mean, at the beginning, I didn't know how it worked. I assumed that theaters reported box office numbers to a distribution company that gave them to Box Office Mojo, the numbers, other reporting services. That isn't exactly how it works. In fact, the distributors, so the ones that are actually distributing the movie, they work directly with the, the companies that produce it. They typically are the ones that report the numbers. Uh, you know, I don't know if they give it to the distribution company or if they, you know, another reporting company, or if they give them directly to, you know, consumer facing sites like Box Office Mojo and the numbers. But in the current environment, uh, the distribution, the, dis- the distributors of the movie give the numbers to both the theaters because most of these are online showing. So they give the online showing numbers back to the theater. So that that's a reverse relationship compared to normal. And they also give them uh, numbers to the numbers uh, and, and box office mojo. So it's, it's not at all what I expected. I, I expect it to be the other way around, but after doing some initial research and contacting theaters where one of my initial, I, I asked them two big questions I was trying to get at one what would it take for you to list a movie? So I mean, it was worded in a way like, what are your movie listing requirements? But ultimately I needed to know if they were open to the idea of showing a movie on short notice. And the second question I needed to ask was, how do you report box office numbers? And in answering that second question, I learned that it was a communication between us and these sites, not the theaters and these sites directly. Did they, did they know what you were kind of up to when you were asking these questions? And did they care? Or was it like, did you have to kind of... Were you up front with what you were trying to do when you were talking to them or yeah, you were just kind of fielding information? I mean, to some extent we were fielding information, but we also were clear that especially past the very initial, like, so with the initial correspondence, it really just was what are your, what are your procedures for listening to movie? How do you report numbers? I'm, I'm doing research because at the time I had literally no idea. We didn't have a movie. We weren't even sure we were going to make a movie. So it was, it was feeling out the, you know, if the logistics would have, would have even worked. So the initial research was just, just figuring that information out. Um, later in the process, uh, we started sharing, uh, you know, we shared with, with all the theaters a full copy of the movie before they you know agreed to show it. We gave them a ton of materials. We were very clear that it was a feature film documentary. And uh, in some cases, uh, like, for example, Tampa, they thought it would be best to release it as part of their limelight professional speaker series. And, and we agreed with them because it, it more clearly fits into that track for, for how they promote films. And, and so we were very supportive of them. And, and of course, they were supportive of us to, to counter propose with something like that. So um, I, I think in general, people were very accepting of the unusual circumstances and understood that we were there out of you know an intent to help them so we mm-hmm. were we really wanted to work with them and like we didn't we came to the table with very very generous terms for people because ultimately the film was about supporting them so they in our experience were very receptive of that and were very very pleased to have built those relationships very cool which theaters did you know to reach out to? Just the ones that were already 
uh, part of these other movies that you saw that got bumped up during Corona? The theaters exactly. that were already sh- showing? Okay. Exactly. So there were, uh, you know, the, the movie that was number one, it actually was still number one the week and weekend when we were uh, showing Phoenix, Oregon. They, uh, I, I was curious how they had any numbers at all. Like, okay, theaters are closed. How are they getting numbers in? And that was the first thing I, I started investigating. So on their webpage, they had a drop down list of theaters that uh, they partnered with. And so I made a, I, I, you know, copied the list down, contacted almost all of them in order to just try and learn more information. So yes, that was, that, that's how I got a short list of theaters to contact. So the, the title of the article in Vice was how a random, what was it? How a random guy, Hold on, let me pull it up. How a random guy made the number two movie in America for a thousand dollars. So I, I saw there was there some uh, pushback from the community. They were they were upset that it wasn't uh, Monero included enough that uh, Monero wasn't in the title of the article or or the focus of the article. Was I, I mean, am I correct <laughs> in seeing that there was a? a little, I think you were getting a little flack for that. I think that the community was overall responsive in a, in a positive way to the article. Yeah, uh, I don't however, see how you could be positive about it. Yeah, it um, uh, ultimately, like, it, it was focused on me predominantly, um, and I made very clear in the correspondence, and I think the article itself clearly also states that the community was r- the real reason this happened. In fact, they feature a quote from me saying that the movie would not have happened at all if I didn't have the support of the community. Right. And so I, I think we received some pushback in that capacity. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I think anyone who reads the article will understand that this was, this was made possible because the Monero community was so strong, not just because some random person wrote a check for $1,000. It, it clearly is not that case. Right. And, and Vice is going to decide how they want to write it, no matter how, what. I mean, it's, that's not up to you to decide what what's slant they take on the article. So you had, right? I mean, that's... Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was a reasonable take, but also, yeah. you know, uh, one of the, I also want to reiterate that a main point of doing this film was to show the Monero community was strong enough and creative enough in order to get something like this accomplished. That, you know, huge goal for us. Yeah, I, I don't think... Uh... I'd like to say I don't think any other uh, crypto communities would be able to pull it off so effectively, so quickly. Maybe Doge. Maybe the Doge community. Doge Surprised community. they didn't beat us to it, actually. You know, in their prime, I could see the Dogecoin community doing this. <laughs> Absolutely. That, this is a very Dogecoin community thing to do. All right. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll keep this one short. Congratulations. I think that was awesome. Um, I know when you called me, I, I, I thought it was a great idea, but obviously... Honestly, I didn't think you'd be able to pull it off. You know, there's, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts, and you did it. That was awesome. I want to I want to end us with a really quick insider story for people who, you know, of course, weren't snooping into the conversations we had when we were first discussing this idea. But we did not know what this movie was going to look like at the time. I had no idea it would be featuring Doctor Daniel Kim at the time. I had not talked to him when we talked. So. We actually decided to record a lot of our initial correspondence because we weren't yeah. sure if the movie was going to be about the making of the movie. <laughs> yeah, which that's what I was gunning for. I thought that would have, but I guess there would have been, then you would have had to edit that all together. You needed to focus on just coming up with something as quick as possible. And the, the bigger issue was just getting the movies to put right, to get it in theaters in time. So you, you could take advantage of that window. I think yeah, we that, had that a you actually tried to turn it into a, a movie. Yeah, we ultimately decided that idea, although exciting, was too complex for the narrow window we had. And uh, so, you know, that, that's an example of us adapting to the process, given the, the adapting circumstances. But I, I had a lot of, uh, you know, of course, it meant a lot to me that you supported me initially. And uh you almost made your way into a, a different variant in a different <laughs> ecosystem of, of a Monero movie there. <laughs> Would have been a better movie, I'm telling you. <laughs> so, uh, so what's next? What's part two? Oh, obviously part two is... With your movie day? Oh, part two is an HBO series, of course. Um, we're, we're gunning for that one. Uh, no, I mean, we, we clearly recognize that this was, was um, uh, an opportunity that does not come around often. So... I, I, I have no personal, uh, you know, further ambitions for movie production because I am awful at it. Uh, but 
it, it is very stressful in the process, but um, I, I think the next steps ultimately for the film are to can, you know, release it to the wider public later, uh, you know, beginning of next month. And then also to continue trying to use it as a tool to promote privacy ideals to, to individuals that are, you know, sort of hooked by the attention of it being the number two movie at a certain point. So uh, those are our goals going in the future. I know. I mean, uh, years ago I had pitched to the Monero community trying to make like a Monero documentary at the time. Um, I would love to see somebody do that. Uh, I, obviously that takes a lot of resources, but to, to, you know, have that on Netflix or something would be, would be amazing. You think we'll, I, we'll, we'll get to that point where somebody in the community kind of steps up, gets it together makes that happen? I mean, I think given the size of the Monero project, it's inevitable. I mean, there, there have been Bitcoin documentaries or have been Ethereum documentaries. I, mean, I hope this inspires someone to make a, a, a more traditional Monero documentary because... Yeah, if, anybody, if anybody's listening right now and is feeling inspired, uh, I think that now's a good time. Right? Yeah, now, I think now would be a good time to strike. I think so too. Well, Monero has a really lively history. There's plenty of things to talk about and... I think, you know, I, I would watch it, of course, but maybe that's not saying much, but I, of course I would watch it. And so therefore I hope that there's one that exists in the future. You know, so, some video of me running for Congress, hopefully uh, a happy ending with me, with me winning as the uh, Monero candidate. It all could be like crescendo quite nicely. <laughs> That'd be great. All right, man. Um, I think that's good. I think that's it. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for coming on. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks, Doug, for having this. I had a lot of fun in the process, learned a lot too. And I hope that, uh, I hope someone watches this and, and is therefore inspired to make a movie. We'll put the link in the show notes, but if everybody, it's just Monero means money, right? Is the. Yep. Title. Monero means dot money. Got it. All right, man. Thanks. Have a good one. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.